My name's Philippe Simé. I'm a philosopher and I'm interested in how architecture tells us about our lifestyles. I'll take you to explore the most singular habitats on the planet, to discover the meaning behind them and to share in their riches. It's a very impressive bridge made of bamboo. We brought the bamboo from my village and built the bridge, as it's the only way to cross the river. Otherwise, we couldn't get to the main village. Is your village far from here? A bit further on. Follow me. Okay, let's go. I'm in the far northeast of India, in Arunachal Pradesh, a little-known state hemmed in by Tibet, Bhutan, and Burma. I'm on my way to Pongin, a remote village located in the Siang Valley, deep within a vast forest. To reach the village, it's a two-hour trek from the bamboo bridge. It's the home of Adi known as the Men of the Hills, an ethnic group of about 100,000 people spread across the Himalayan region. In this state, long closed off to the outside for political and military reasons, the Adi had no choice but to become self-sufficient. Here's my village. 50 families live here. There are several ethnic groups in this region. People call us Adi, men of the hills. The Adi have learned to live with a local material, bamboo. They use it to build the framework and walls of their homes, but also their furniture. The Adi have managed to make use of all the potentials of bamboo and live self-sufficiently, making their isolation a strength. Renewable and free, bamboo is a precious resource for them and at the heart of a unique environmental and social ecosystem. And here's my house. Ah. Oh yes, you can see everything's in bamboo. The framework, but also the panels. Is this bark? All our houses are constructed with bamboo. Even the walls and floors are in bamboo. We split the bamboo in two and then weave it together. We don't use any metal or nails. We use only bamboo for the construction. It's very beautiful because it makes geometric patterns all over the walls. Come in, I'll show you the inside. Okay, thanks. Hello. Hello. We call this room the volume. It's where the hearth is, where we cook, and where we sit in winter. So who shares this house? The first room is my daughter and son-in-law's bedroom. These two rooms are their children's rooms. That's my wife's room, and if we have guests, we put them up in here. I think the bamboo brings a lot of softness and lightness to this house. It makes the house very comfortable, because it protects from the wind. So in winter, we feel really snug and safe in here. Another thing I like is, you feel as if you're constantly in touch with the outdoors. The bamboo filters noise and light, but without cutting you off from the outside. I think that's an interesting thing. 
This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. How about some tea? Sure, I'd love some. Hand me the tongs. Thank you. When you drink a cup of hot tea, it gives you strength. Let's drink together. <clears throat> it's good. It's a very beautiful house. How long have you lived here? Oh, 20 years. Uh -huh. But every five or six years, we have to do repairs. Because gradually, leaks appear in the roof and the house gets damaged in places. Once a house is too damaged, we build a new one. Any bamboo that's still usable we recycle it into the new house. We only throw away bamboo we can't use. In the heart of this remote region, the Adi, of Tibeto-Burman origin, are either animists or Christians. They seem to have escaped the great movements in Indian history. For centuries, their life has been structured around rice farming, hunting, gathering, and of course, the use of bamboo, which is central to their material culture. Bamboo has a unique beauty. Tall and frail, buffeted by the winds, and yet so robust, it's able to resist all the hazards of nature much like the Adi, who have found their place in the middle of all these forests. Bamboo has numerous qualities, but the most important is that it grows incredibly fast, from 30 centimeters to one meter a day. The village is magnificent, set amongst the mountains, with all its bamboo houses. Have the Adi always built like this? We've always built houses in the way we know how. Sometimes to a T-shaped plan, and sometimes to an L-shaped plan, but always according to our tradition. Yes, I noticed there were two types of houses here. One, where the houses have a kind of substructure filled with branches, and another, where the house stands on small plates. That's right, two types of house, the one we live in, and the one where we store grain and rice, which is raised. We fix the plates to protect it from rats and snakes. It stops them from climbing up. But have the Adi always used bamboo to build their homes? Construction has always been done with bamboo because it's easy to transport and assemble. And when people get old, they can't carry wood anymore, so it's much easier to use bamboo. Is the survival of the Adi really linked to this natural environment? Yes. Without this natural resource, our people wouldn't be able to survive. We'd have nowhere to live. Ghani Zaman is one of a generation of Indian architects who wants to combine local traditions with the techniques of modern engineering. A renowned specialist, he has dedicated his life to bamboo. 
He visits the Adi to learn more and swap knowledge with the people who, since learning how to walk, live for and with bamboo. So the house you're building will be just like this one. All the houses are the same, right? For how many years will they be inhabitable? Five, six. Five, six. Seven? Seven years. Six. Six. Six, okay, okay. Ghani has recently designed a roofing system and has come to seek advice about its reliability from the inhabitants of Pongin. The rain will come in here and go out there. It won't leak inside into the house. And if ever a piece of bamboo breaks, you just have to replace it. Whereas with leaf roofs, the slightest leak and you'll have to change the whole roof. If you use this roofing, it will really be practical for you. And you'll have a lot less effort to make. Do you think this technique could be good if you used it in your village? Yes, it's very interesting. It looks like a very good alternative. We won't have to change the leaves, and we'd save a lot of time. Plus, it'll last much longer. Sure. In Pongin, everyone is curious to discover new techniques and ready to share their know-how. Around the village, there aren't vast bamboo forests, just small plots. But they meet the needs of all the inhabitants and allow them to be self-sufficient. For the Adi, everything is a machete's length away. A new house needs to be built. All the men join in. I accompany them to a bamboo plantation on the edge of the village. Bonnie, how do you pick which bamboos to cut? If we cut them during the full moon, it's no good. Because that's when they have the highest quantity of sugar, and that attracts insects. So we wait until the third day after the full moon before cutting them. Do you want to try cutting one? Sure, I'd love to. Hey. Okay. Let's go. The machete's really sharp. I'm not very accurate. I'm chopping everywhere. It's not easy. Almost there. No, um, chop at this angle. Like this? Backhand. I thought it was the age of the bamboo that mattered. You can't cut bamboo before it's two years old. We can tell its age from its bark. Look at this one. It's smooth and clean. So it's a baby bamboo. On the older plants, you can see black marks. As they grow, the bark becomes rougher. To build a house, how many bamboos like this do you need? Because they're really big. We estimate the number of bamboo plants we need instinctively. So, first and foremost, I listen to my heart. But I do know that for a small house, you need about 50. To build a large house, you need about 100. Okay, here we go. Let's make it fall. Thanks. Oh, 
Pass, 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 pass. All right, it's not exactly the same. You need to get the hang of it. I chop any which way. Bamboo poles are light and easy to carry. Like worker ants, in less than an hour, we bring back the necessary quantity of bamboo to build the new house. In the village, everyone goes about their business. Whether it's school lessons, cooking or farming, the Adi lead a structured life based around family and community activities. Ghani Zaman constructs exclusively in bamboo. The renowned architect has set himself the task of showing that it is possible to reappropriate this rarely used material and to make the pillar of a new type of architecture. In the world, we have about 1,700 species of bamboo, out of which 900 species grow in the Northeast India. Ah, right. So why should I not be here? Why should I be anywhere else? Because bamboo is my life. And I need to work with bamboo and, and, and show the, the developed countries to what you have done to the world and destroyed it with your CO2s and all the gases that you've given up. We, in the Northeast, have the answer to your problem. So I'm here and I'm exploring that. Why did you choose bamboo as your main material? If I use wood, let's say I'm okay. using wood. If I cut one tree, it'll take me 40 years, 30 years to recut it and use it. Whereas in the area of bamboo, I cut today one, five will grow up by itself. That's one, the reason. Secondly, bamboo absorbs 30% more CO2 than trees do. Uh, and gives out equally amount of oxygen than trees do. Many people see bamboo as the poor man's wood. So is it easy to spread the word about its qualities? In the School of Architecture, very specifically, especially in India, uh, other places also, um, they do not talk about bamboo. Ah. Because bamboo is a poor man's timber. Right. And bamboo is used for scrap holding, for painting right. your building. Besides, there's nothing else. We, as architects who have got together and we are building houses, high-end houses for very rich people, trying to show them and ex explaining and also proving to them that bamboo is a rich man's timber also, not only a poor man's. But we're also trying to increase the economy of the people. If I can tell these people to give me bamboo, I can buy it from them and build houses for the, for the rich. So these people get an earning. They do not have to leave their village to go to a city and create bigger slums. This is going to help them. They'll sit at home and earn money. I presume you also like bamboo for its physical properties. Bamboo has to be felt, has to be understood. You cannot grab a bamboo and break it or cut it. You have to understand it. The texture of the bamboo, the species of the bamboo, how much compression that bamboo can take, how much tensile the bamboo can take. It's not easy. It has a learning process, step by step. You have to fall in love with that. Then only can you. <laughs> The house is being built for Billing, and it's a genuine collective undertaking. Every generation is involved, and they all know how to work bamboo. Everything is used, and nothing is thrown away. What are they doing there? Uh, what they're doing here is splitting the bamboo. Okay. 
and you can see they are going to make it into a flat. This is the flooring. Ah, this also it will be made into a wall, weaving it okay. into the wall. This is a technique which is not only, not, it is common to all tribals of Northeast India. Okay. Everyone will do it. Because this is one of the most sustainable flooring system or walling system you can get. Okay. Okay, now he's go to the next one. See the node. The node he breaks here and it goes right to the next, next node. The it's splitting node. more and more. Because the bamboo has long fibers, um, unlike wood. Right. Wood has got short fiber. Right. The bamboo has long fiber. Because of the fiber, the tensile of bamboo is very, very good. They've taken the split bamboo and made it into a floor. So this has got the tensile and it's got a springy motion. So you're not actually walk, walking on hard concrete floor. You walk the feet on the bottom of your feet. You have nerve endings. Right. That gets massaged. A foot massage? Yeah. <laughs> then the tying. You can see the tying has been done with cane. With this? This is the, the skin of the bamboo. Ah, oui, oui. They will use it as a rope. But this it needs to dry. Yes. And the more they tie it, the more drier it gets, the tighter it will become. I see. Oni. Working hard? Everything is tied together like that? Yes, as it is, okay. And they will use the tree, the palm tree leaf. Those? Yeah. They will use that, and it is very good for waterproofing. Uh -huh. It's all local resources. Everything grows right here. Now, if you look at the foundation, it's not very deep foundation. It's a light foundation. You can tell they don't have to dig very deep. They will go in this much, into the ground. Oh, yes, Just, yeah, about one foot down. Right. Now, you can see that they have cut into the U shape. Ah, oui. U shape. Yeah, like this. Pour, pour so they can fix uh, other pieces of bamboo inside. Yeah, yeah. Et, uh, How long does it take them to build a house like this? This one will take about two days. Uh -huh. Two days. So Is that all? That's a complete two days. Wow. So if you're going to get married and you want to shift in with your wife to a new house for your honeymoon, they will build it for you. So, two days. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Only for you two. Just don't make a racket, huh? <laughs> Fantastic. Follow me. It's finished, huh? It's magnificent. Good evening. Good evening. Ah, so you're all dressed up. Yes, it's our feast day dress. It's very beautiful. Really, really nice. Can we see the house? It looks superb from here. Go inside. It's brand new. I'll go take a look. Go on, go on. Go right in. Okay, okay, I'll take a look. You're welcome. Can I go in? <laughs> Billing's house is finished. According to tradition, all of the villagers gather for a ceremony. Hello. It's great here, all around the fire. We have much to learn from the lifestyle of the Adi. They have managed to turn their isolation into a real strength by taking advantage of bamboo.
With this material alone, natural, long-lasting, and sustainable, they have adapted to their environment. For them, bamboo is more than the material condition of their existence. It's also central to an authentic way of life, more respectful of nature and of mankind. My name's Philippe Simé. I'm a philosopher, and I'm interested in what architecture can tell us about our lifestyles. I'll take you to explore some of the most remarkable habitats on the planet in order to discover their meaning and to share their riches. I'm in Burkina Faso in West Africa, 172 kilometers south of its capital, Ouagadougou. Here, in the village of Tibili, which has 17,000 inhabitants, we find the royal court of the Kisena, an ethnic group settled on a territory shared with Ghana. Since the 16th century, the royal court has been the Kisena people's center of political and religious power. This is where the crown princes and their families live. It is their job to arbitrate disputes between the inhabitants of neighboring villages and to ensure traditions are respected. The architecture of this court is fascinating. With its differently shaped mud huts, painted and decorated with colorful motifs, this organic cluster covers 1.5 hectares and is rich in meaning and symbols. More than a simple dwelling, it is a link between the various generations of Kisena. To find out more, I'm meeting Cyril, one of the crown princes. Welcome, Philippe. Thank you. Are you well? Yes, very well, thank you. Okay. Hello, everyone. Is this the entrance to the royal court? This is the main entrance to the royal court. You can see the layout. Each village has a stone reserved to sit on when invited by the chief. That means we can't sit where we like? No, we can't sit where we like. This is reserved solely for notables of the royal court, the older people in the royal court. Okay. Here is for princes and chiefs. Only princes? Princes and chiefs. It's very impressive. Come with me. Very well. The Kisena live traditionally from growing rice and millet, raising animals and hunting. But nowadays, Tibili is mainly known for its crafts. This royal court is confusing. With its group of huts in no apparent order, its enclosed spaces turned in upon themselves and its narrow, winding streets, it resembles a maze. I'm having trouble understanding its overall plan, who is present, and what is happening here. How is this royal court organized? This royal court is organized into concessions. And within a concession, there are several households. Yes. And each household has several houses. Inside these houses are the grandparents, the women, the children, the nephews, the cousins, the brothers, all that makes a household. 
So a household is a group of huts which house people of the same family. Right. You can recognize it more easily from the entrance gates. Here? This is a household. It's magnificent. This is all one household. It's all one household. What's lovely here is seeing that the huts don't have the same shape at all. When you're young, and after your 18th birthday, you make a round hut. Mm -hmm. And that shows that you're a bachelor. So you stay in a cramped hut just enough to live in. When you think about marriage, you build a rectangular house where you can live with a wife and children. And on the other side is a figure eight shaped house where grandma lives. And this mother house is the guardian of certain family treasures and fetishes. Does that mean the space is organized around this mother house? Necessarily, because it's the very first house to be built and it houses everything that we deem precious. All the houses cluster around this house. It has a figure of eight shape. You need to be above the house to see it. If you're not above, you can't see the layout. No. The architecture of the royal court is reminiscent of a fortress. Originally, it was meant to protect the inhabitants from inter-ethnic conflicts, as well as from any wild animals at large in the region. Today, it is still surrounded by high walls forming an enclosure that is difficult to cross. This same protective mindset is also found in the dwellings. To enter them, you must pass through a single, cramped opening less than one meter in height. Wow. You really have to bend. Yeah, to get down on all fours, as we say. This is astonishing. Yes. And it goes on. We must kneel here, too? Yes, we always have to kneel. Yes. We always come in on all fours. And it's not as easy. It's a means of protection. Is that why it's complicated? See where the door is opposite the wall? If the enemy wants to enter the house, he must get down on all fours. The head of the household takes up his initial defense position and stands here, and then he waits. Once the person, the enemy, shows his head, he cuts it off, and his head falls. It falls here. It could be a wild animal that would eat humans. It's impossible to get in. Even for the arrow's strategy, you see this wall? The arrow can't get past. In a war, if they fire arrows from outside, the arrows hit this wall, and fall. It's a very clever system because, in fact, there is a sequence of entrances that force intruders to show themselves. Exactly. The posts and beams, aren't these load-bearing walls? We have two types of construction, in fact. Construction with mud bricks, which can bear that weight and construction with kneaded mud balls. This is the ancient technique, because this is an old house. Houses built of kneaded mud balls were among the very first constructions. So by building with kneaded mud balls, the architects put in the beams which hold the struts, and above the struts, we laid planks, and above the planks, now we'll put some earth. To make a roof terrace. To make a roof terrace. The dark, confined nature of the rooms explains why the Kasena people's life is mainly spent outside. They meet up and cook together every day in the courtyard, the real living area, and sleep on the rooftop terraces. All this gives the public spaces an extremely lively character and an opportunity for discussion and sharing. OK, and there are systems of stairs leading to? To the roof. They can be earthenware stairs or wooden ladders. This is a ladder. That's a ladder for climbing up to a roof terrace. It's a wooden ladder. Can I see? Yes, no problem. So we can put a mat here to sleep on. Yes, that's for sleeping. And also just after the harvest, we have to find a place to dry it. So it's preferable to put the harvest on the terrace than in the courtyard. 
This is great. We have a view of the whole of the concession. Yes. The striking thing in Tbilisi is less the diverse shapes of the dwellings than the variety of their composition. The royal court is a dynamic architectural collection that evolves in lines with changes within the family and their needs. New huts are built while others wait to be reclaimed. I visit one of the construction sites, curious to know what building techniques the Kasena use. My cousin. Yes. His name is Apolit. Hello. Hello. Are you well? Fine, and you? Very well, thanks. Is this your home? Yes, and my home is under construction. It's rectangular. Are you about to marry? Yes, soon. Congratulations. Thank you. Is that just earth? No, it's earth mixed with straw. Okay. It's funny because you can't really see it. You can't see straw here. Yes, because you have to pour water on the straw so that it rots, in fact. Okay. I was wondering where it came from. Is it from over there? No, it comes from this same house which collapsed a long time ago. Because my parents used to live in it before they went to the mother house. That's why it fell down. They really are local materials. Most everything is recycled. It's all recycled, in fact. How long ago did this begin? Because I can see you've started a wall there. When you begin here, you have to stop for a while before continuing. You need three stages to complete the house with three drying times, in fact. How exactly does it work? They are mud balls that we cut and layer, one on top of another. I saw that you smooth them a little. That's right, we smooth them. The technique is rather like pottery. Yes, because we're using the same system, in fact. It's a very interesting system because to raise the wall, you don't need a support or foundations. You can do it directly like that on the floor. For a foundation, we can also use stones that we use as a base, in fact. And now we apply the balls in layers. I saw that the base is a little wider than the top. It gets slimmer as it goes up. Yes. As you can see, we don't have tree trunks long enough to make roofs with them. So the system is that we build this up until the top is like a pyramid in order to find the right sized trunks to make the roof. And then put them on later? That's right. Does everyone build their home or is it just certain men? There are specialists who do this, in fact. Now the other men have to participate too, because as you know, it's a group project, a solidarity project, so you can't do it alone. That changes everything when it's a labor that you share. That's right, because it's also a chance for the children to learn building work while they're building. So it's the time when a family and a household have a building to do. The whole family comes together. All those who can, who are free, they come. At the same time, it's a way for them to learn how to build. So the children watch the adults as they work? They observe and often participate. So they take part too. So they learn young to build various types of huts? Yes. We in Europe have a very individual but also very distinct relationship with construction because we never build our houses ourselves, others do it. Here what is interesting is everyone takes part in making houses. In Africa, especially in Kasena country, we don't have any customs like that because it costs us very dearly to ask someone and to give him money so he builds a house for us. And on top of that, part of Kasena tradition is what we call family solidarity. So once your house is underway, everyone pitches in to help. And at the same time, you take part in the building of your own home. That makes you take care of it and also makes the others take care of it too. That's what we call Gurusi, this Kasena solidarity. When we start to build a Kasena house, it's the beginning of the transmission of Kasena building know-how. Earlier, I saw the women singing and the men working. Is building reserved exclusively for men? Yes, building is reserved for men. 
If you saw a woman to one side singing and shouting, that's done to encourage the men, to give them strength to work. Okay, and do they take part in the building of the house? No, they don't take part in building the house. However, the decoration is their business. I see. So all the paintings we can see outside? The paintings you see are done by the women. Just the women? Just the women. So the tasks are shared according to their type? That's right. Okay. In Burkina Faso, rain is the arch enemy of architecture. It not only erodes the concession's land, but also the buildings. The painted murals have a value beyond decoration. They also work as a protective coating. Each year between March and April, just before the rainy season, the women get together and decorate all of the walls in their huts. Further on in the concession, a group of women is busy preparing a wall. Awa, whose home will be decorated, asked other women to help. In return, she must feed them. Kaye, the oldest, takes charge of the work. I watch as various materials are prepared. First, the mud plaster, which serves as a base. The wall is then covered in laterite, a red rock powder. <laughs> the women use rollers or feathers to draw the motifs. All these stages require a great deal of precision and coordination. Hello, Kaye. Hello. What are you doing? I'm preparing the graphite mixture. Uh -huh. So this is graphite? Yes, for the paintings. And what's that? Soro. Soro. Does Soro help you fix the black color? Mm. Yes, in a way. It's what we mix with the graphite to fix it on the laterite. Mm -hmm. When you polish it, it hardens and resists the rain. Mm. Look, it resists well. I see. Yes, it's sticky. Yes, it's becoming a tiny bit more solid. Is the fixative just for the graphite or for the laterite too? It's just for the graphite, the black. We use talc for the white color. We buy it in Ghana because there's none here. Do you have to wait for the wall to dry before you start painting? We don't have to wait until it's completely dry. It still has to be fresh for the color to take on the laterite. 
If the wall is too dry, the paintings will wash away with the first rains. That means the preparation of the walls, the coating and the paint must be done in one day. Yes, it all must be done in one day. We scrape, we dampen, we put on the various coatings. Then we can do the decorating. It all must be done in one day. Come on, we'll give them room to paint. Right. It's great to see all these women working together. Do the women always help each other each time you build a house? Mm -hmm. The reason all the women come to help me paint is that some are coming to learn. They want to understand the painting techniques as well as the preparation techniques. Every year, the girls from the schools here and in other towns come to learn these techniques so that they can apply their know-how at home. Sometimes white girls even come from Europe. They leave here very happy. It's not just knowledge that you pass on, because when I saw you all laughing together, I can imagine you talk about lots of things. Sure. It's not just transmission, but a social link as well. We talk among women about our various problems in our day-to-day -day lives. That's why these paintings are our identity, that of the Kisena women. When you look at this, you know that it's the work of Kisena women. When you live here, you understand. What's terrific about that wall is that there are several geometric motifs that are repeated. Do they mean something? Yes. Each motif has a meaning. I'll show you. Okay. This one represents the morning drum that wakes the chief. These are arrows to remind us of our various conflicts. Here we have a hawk to remind us that it endangers our chickens and that it can carry one off at any time. And this one, shaped like a W. That's the bat. Oh, right. What does this bat symbol say? It brings fresh air into the house and rids us of insects. Its wings replace the fan. I have the impression that all these symbols are in a way checklists that remind us of the key aspects of Kasena life. It's the Kasena memory. Mm -hmm. It prevents us from forgetting who we are. It's so we remember. Several lives are on these walls. If I disappeared, my children would only have these symbols to remember me by. I think that what has been put on this wall is a part of me, but above all, of what I give of myself. I am moved listening to Kaye. Much more than just techniques, what she transmits is the identity and the memory of Kasena women. <laughs> After the day's work is done, the women prepare the meal. Tonight, we will eat to, the national dish of Burkina Faso, made up of millet balls with a sesame sauce. Bye. 
าถึงนานะจะนอกาวจะมาถึงจิงกาวแล้วนอนตอนนั้นก็ไม่รู้จักจะบุญดังนั้นเดี๋ยวคุณคุณมาลีบก็ต้อง The Kasena also have oral-based traditions. I find the men gathered around the fire to listen to stories, another way of passing on their culture and their values to the younger generations. Oh, wow. I love it. I'd already seen Cyril with his boo boo. It's handsome. Handsome, yes. Well, you are smart. And what was his name in Kasena? I have a Kasena name. Yes, we gave you a name. It's Korase. Korase. That's really good. At the end of this trip, I understand that Kasena architecture is not limited to the building itself, but it is expressed first and foremost in the act of building. The materials, techniques, and the songs form the foundations of social bonds. They find unity in building together, both in space and in time. You gave me the hardest one, Kaye. Oh, I could do better. Oh, I did that one. My name's Philippe Simé. I'm a philosopher, and I'm interested in what architecture can tell us about our lifestyles. I'll take you to explore some of the most remarkable habitats on the planet in order to discover their meaning and to share their riches. The south coast of Iceland. A few kilometers away from these black sand beaches, from this volcanic soil, lie the Westman Islands. The Westman Islands are the Earth's youngest land, born just 12,000 years ago. This archipelago, south of the Arctic Circle, receives the full force of the ocean storms and icy cold winds. Located at the junction of tectonic plates, its volcanic activity is unique in the world. Out of the 17 islands making up the archipelago, only Imae is inhabited, and it's Iceland's most important fishing port. How do its 4,500 or so inhabitants manage to live in such an unstable and hostile environment? Throster grew up on this island and has witnessed many extreme and often dramatic climactic events. Throster, hello. Bonjour. Hello. Oh, that's a big one. <laughs> At first sight, laid on the ground, 
The MA houses appear light and fragile, as if directly exposed to the harshness of the climate and environment. You really get the impression that the village is set right in the middle of all these crags that are everywhere. That's right, Imae is a young island. The oldest parts of the island are only 12,000 years old, and the most recent mountain is only 40 years old. So it's a young, active land, and it's quite an adventure to live here. Look at this, for example. It's pumice stone. It's from lava from the volcano that erupted in 1973. What happened exactly in 1973? On January 23rd, the first day of the eruption, lava started to flow down towards the village and the houses. The eruption lasted five months and 400 homes were buried in lava and ash. It was a major disaster. But on the positive side, as a result of this, the village is more sheltered now and better protected against the severe weather. Throster takes me to the lava flow that buried a part of the island and modified its perimeter as well as its landscape. The lava flow stopped here. There you can see the remains of the former water tank of our swimming pool, which was located a bit farther down. It was completely covered by lava in the last days of the eruption. What stopped the lava flow? The lava was cooled by seawater through big water hoses. There was a whole battalion of fire engines, dozens of them. It was incredible. You see how close it is? The lava you see there. There used to be a plane there before. The harbor entrance came close to being completely blocked off. The destruction of the harbor would have deprived the inhabitants of their main livelihood. Luckily, the eruption didn't claim any lives. Despite the violence of the elements, most of the inhabitants decided to remain on the island and rebuild not only their homes, but also the roads and the public spaces. Wow. Are those the ruins of a house frozen in lava? Yes, it's incredible. It's one of the last remaining houses that used to stand here. There are the rebars and the wooden window frames there. It's incredible. People said that the house was protected by a guardian angel because it still remained standing while lava flowed all around it. But it finally collapsed and was swallowed up in its turn. And look at this one. It's unusual. It's a 70s style house. You can see everything, the sand flow, the curtains, the wallpaper, everything's still there. It's disturbing. It is surprising that it's still standing after all this time. These houses frozen in lava, snapshots of a moment of life, are quite moving. They're the painful reminder of a natural disaster. But Throster and the other inhabitants don't look at it this way. For them, the eruption happened, but it's in the past now, and it's time to move on. Hi, hi. I brought back some fish. This is Philippe. Hello, pleased to meet you. Hello, Aslog. Philippe. Go into the living room, I'll bring the coffee through. Okay. Okay. You were here in 73. Can you describe what happened? I remember that a few minutes before it happened, on January 22nd, I was outside with my family, enjoying the evening air. It was very hot, 
It felt like we were on a Mediterranean island. We thought it was just exceptionally good weather. We didn't realize the heat was coming from the ground. Later that evening, there was a tremendous earthquake. We looked out the window and saw a gigantic wall of fire. Look. The lava spurts are incredibly high. The wall of fire was three kilometers long. There, you can see the eruption taking place. Wow. You can see all the falling rock. It was very exciting, for me in any case. It was like an adventure. It's magnificent. It was strange. The police had a hard time keeping people away from the area. But when it became necessary to evacuate the island and everybody had to get in boats or head towards the aerodrome, it was as if they had rehearsed it. It was very well organized. After that, most of the inhabitants of the Westman Islands were just waiting for one thing, to be able to come back home. Once the schools reopened and things got back to normal again, the people returned and resumed their life here on the island. I have a hard time understanding how one can live in such a dangerous environment under the constant threat of a volcano erupting or of an earthquake. We're quite fatalistic. Throughout the ages, we've lived through a lot of things, but they've only made us stronger rather than the opposite. When I arrived here on the island, I was very much struck by the contrast between the grandiose nature and the modest appearance of the architecture, as if it were deferring to the force of the elements. Yes, you're right. The environment plays an important role in our lives. Our priority is our work, our family, our neighbors, the houses come after that. It's a very close-knit family community here. But I can tell you that in the end, it's the environment that keeps us here. That's what bonds us together. In Iceland, you can witness the transformation of the landscape from the balcony of your house. The land was very flat here. Mant Helgafell was over there, and there used to be a plain there. Now there's a new land, a new mountain. The instability of the environment surrounding these houses overturns our perception of the habitat, which is based on the idea of protection and safety. It's beautiful. As I walk on this volcanic soil, I realize that here, the house isn't a place of refuge or a protective habitat. For the inhabitants of Imae, it's just a simple dwelling place that can be destroyed in just a few hours, minutes even. In order to live here, they have no choice but to live in harmony with nature, live as one with it, and take advantage of what it has to offer. What a great view. Yes, here we're at the summit of the volcano. There's the crater, well, part of it, because a whole section broke off and was swept away by the lava flow. It's that big rock over there, near the harbour. We call it the drifter. From here, you can really see that this volcano is both a destructive and creative force because it's transformed the entire landscape of the island. Yes. 30 million tons of volcanic matter was ejected from the crater. The island expanded by 2.5 kilometers. This zone was completely transformed. The neighboring island of Sertsi, for example, came into existence 52 years ago following an eruption as well as two other small islands, but they've since disappeared. 
Some people think that Circe Island will remain a small island, but others think that it's going to disappear in its turn. It's incredible to think that here, in Iceland, we can actually witness the birth and death of an island. Yeah. Wow. There's still a lot of heat here. You can feel the energy. The temperature at the summit is still so hot that we can bake bread here. In some spots, the temperature of the ground just beneath our feet is 300 degrees. Ha, look, she's baking bread. Hi there. Hello. Are you baking bread? Yes, I'm making rye bread. I bury the rye bread dough in a hot spot. Uh -huh. After 10 hours, it'll be ready. Okay. I see. So, is this something that you started doing after the 1973 eruption? Or have you always done this? Here on the island, a lot of people started baking rye bread after the eruption. Only a few people still continue to do it. The ground's cooled down now, so you really have to climb up to the summit to be able to bake bread. OK. You need gloves. Can I try it? Yeah. Thanks. It's hot. It's very hot. <laughs> mm, it's good. With a bit of lava. Yes, there are a few stones. The Imae inhabitants live in a constant state of uncertainty and have to deal with natural hazards. Baking your bread in a still hot soil is the sign of the ability to adapt and to use whatever these hazards produce. The hostile environment of this very young land, constantly reshaped by the forces of nature, still continues to meet their needs. This part of the island, for example, which was totally transformed by the lava flows, is now used as a golf course. An unlikely yet wonderful place where Throster and his nephews are enjoying a game of golf. It takes incredible energy to completely rebuild a village that's been almost completely destroyed. Yes. We draw our strength from the mountains, the sea, and from all this natural beauty around us. We're surrounded by energy. It's fantastic. I get the impression that when you live on land that's as young as this island, you're less afraid to start over again. This environment challenges us, but also makes us stronger because it brings us together. It creates a social bond and motivates us to go on. To live on this island is to permanently brave the four natural elements, earth, water, air, and fire, which define our primary relationship with the natural world. Elements which, since the beginning of time, ceaselessly vie with each other and make light of man. I'm beginning to think that what keeps the Imae inhabitants here is precisely this instability of nature. They find their stability in instability and their place in the shifting order of the elements. Froster has suggested that I meet Jacob, one of his friends who hunts puffin, a bird that Icelanders have been eating since the time of the Vikings. It's magnificent. 
Jacob spends all his time on the island's cliffs, on the edge of the void between the earth, the sky, the sea, and the wind. That's a big one. They have amazing beaks. How long have you been hunting puffins? I've been hunting puffins every year since the age of nine. Here on the island, we hunt according to our needs, no more. We're respectful of our environment. We're very close to nature and feel its presence very strongly. Nature here is varied, but when you've known it since childhood, you know where every stone is. Even during fog or a storm, you know exactly where you're walking. I prefer being outdoors rather than cooped up inside my apartment. There are many ways of being in nature. We take home elements from outside to study them there. I paint and draw all this as part of the landscape. It inspires me very much. It's hard for me to understand how one can find one's place in such a changing and uncertain environment. Here everything can change and be transformed. There are sometimes landslides. Nature can be both dangerous and very beautiful. It's the same thing with politics. They decide what to do and inform us after the fact. Just like with nature, a hillside can collapse and you notice the damage the next day. It's like a house swept away in an eruption. It's simply gone. That's how it is. But you're alive. Normally, whether by instinct or simple logic, one tends to keep away from the edge of a void and build far away from the side of a volcano or an area vulnerable to storms. But the MIA inhabitants do just the opposite. They set up home here. They stay here. Living on such a small island, aren't they tempted by the prospect of better horizons? A 70-year-old sailor, such as Grimmer, has he never felt like leaving here and never coming back? You've lived through everything. Earthquakes, volcanic eruptions, ocean storms. Don't you find it too harsh living here? No. No, no. In 1965, when Surtsey came out of the sea, we were fishing herring just at the site of the eruption site. The herring were attracted by the heat. We had a problem with the boat, a propeller problem, and we couldn't move. The boat got stuck. When the eruption stopped, we were sucked into the spiral produced by the crater. And when the eruption started again, we were ejected from it. That happened several times. And yet, you've never left here. No, no, no. I'll never leave here. This is all I know. The MIA inhabitants show unfailing determination in their ways of coping with their hostile environment and seem to have learned how to use it to their advantage. Merci. 
I decide to pay a visit to the engineer who runs the island's geothermal plant, a perfect example of reactivity in the face of hazards. It seems completely crazy to me that you can live on an island where a volcano can suddenly appear, where earthquakes take place and faults appear that fracture the entire island, where there are storms, where you see other islands appear and disappear. It's a kind of chaos, really. We have an expression here, benefit from your enemy. For example, we use the steam emitted by the eruption to heat our homes. The eruption produced a large mass of lava with extreme heat, and this energy provided heating for the village for 10 years, and at no cost. But this energy was used up after 10 years. You've learned to take advantage of the volcano's natural resources, even if it's in the context of a natural disaster. What's particular here is that for the first time in the world, an eruption took place in an urban zone. That's why this geothermal plant that we built here is unique in the world. We would have liked this energy source to last longer, but unfortunately, it's nature that commands. Nature commands, maybe, but the Imae inhabitants seem to enjoy it and take advantage of it. Cliff climbing or excursions in the archipelago are the main leisure activities here. Today, Jacob and Throster invite me to launch at the summit of a neighboring island. The ascension is difficult and we have to climb for almost an hour, sometimes with the help of a rope. But our efforts are well rewarded. The view over MIA is breathtaking. Ah, so we took the easy route, I see. Is that the hard one? We climb directly up like that? In another life, maybe, but not right now. <laughs> Why did you build a cabin so high up? It's the best hunting spot in the whole of the Westman Islands. Some people stay here for six weeks. It's a real gem of nature. I came to the Westman Islands wondering how one could live in a risk situation and prepare for disasters. Finally, I met people who accept natural hazards and adapt to them with pragmatism. By braving life on this island, which is more completely home to them than the house they live in, they found their own personal way of inhabiting an uncertain world. Really? It's so high up. I'm going to get pulverized. No, 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 no. But it hurts though, doesn't it? If you fall from here, Oh, it's fantastic. I love this. I could do this forever. Okay, let's go.